delighted to have you back to Think Tech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. This being our 278th show. And thanks to our producer, Michael, he will show you down there which accumulated viewer you are, the 14,834th, which we appreciate very much. We is, this is the Boston Banish Boost, volume 15 already. And we have Mr. Boston Banish Booster Metnoblet with us from uh, his uh, Boston, Massachusetts, and more specifically today from the building that we are analyzing and have him share with us because he just came out of a class that he taught in the engineering building in Harvard, uh, in Boston, Massachusetts. And we have me, Martin Despang, uh, today uh, at, in Mülheim an der Ruhr. And we will hopefully have back in our Honolulu in the Bishop Museum, the Soto Brown with us soon when we come back in a second. All right, Matt, for the time being, it's just us, the tempered guys uh, in pretty <laughs> similar uh, temperatures, uh, not quite half around the world as from here to Honolulu, but far away enough, um, sort of just around the freezing point. And before we go back to uh, your building that greatly you moved into it for today's show, <laughs> let's do some little bit peer review and get us to uh, another city here in Germany, which is uh, your buddy Bundet's favorite city, which is Duisburg in Germany here. And uh, Mülheim, we should have added an der Ruhr, and Ruhr is the river, and you call this area the Ruhrpott or the Kohlenpot, uh, because this is where the heavy fossil industry at least used to be, a heavy steel manufacturing, sort of like the Pittsburgh of Germany. <laughs> so um, we there's a building here. I'm, I'm here with uh, Joey and Lenny and their ladies. And Joey uh, used to go to school uh, to his uh, do his master's in automotive manage, uh, engineering management here. And he lived right by this building here. And so let's um, share that a little bit with the audience. And I had the chance to, uh, uh, thanks to the uh, management of the building, they let us in, me with my iPhone and with Zoom. And I have the emerging Hawaii architectural generation to check it out tomorrow from inside out, because that's most important. And as just promised, here he is. Our wishes came true. DeSoto is with us. Hi, DeSoto. Hello, everybody. <laughs> So before we go back and see what we can learn from your building in, in Harvard, uh, Matt, for us back in Honolulu with our endless summers, we want to take advantage of us being at you know, different places. Um, and me in Germany here in the Ruhrpott, in the Kohlenpott, and this building here. It's a little provocative for you and I, Matt, because we went to architecture training school around the same pretty dark days of the just demise of postmodernism in the late uh, you know, 80s, early 90s. But there's always exceptions to a rule, to that bad rule of the bad times back then. And uh, this is one of the buildings that was pretty hot and pretty fresh back then, uh, dates back to 1993. This is by Lord Foster, Norman Foster. And it's here in Duisburg. It's the Business Promotion Center. And yeah, let's uh, bring you into Soto just to quiz you on which are, which are things, I mean, you've been in Boston back then as a child, but you rightly so, I mean, from your point of view, you said, okay, I'm never going to go back. So you have memories, but we're freshing these memories from in terms of climate, and we're assessing things in terms of the criteria of skins, our first skin that we're born with, the second one that we put over, which you don't have to unless you sit in your chilled uh, museum office there and the third skin we also don't really need so much as we need it existentially here and that's that's obviously the point so what what do you see uh the soto that sort of makes you think about you know things uh, differences and similarities uh to back in honolulu well of these are four photographs that i'm looking at right now i see in the bottom left corner a traditional building in the distance, which has a stone or uh, uh, brick exterior of some kind that's hard. And that's going to be something that protects you from the cold, that insulates you from the cold. 
But in that same photograph on the right, we see a fully glazed, just uh, glass wall made of large glass panels. This is not a substance that's normally that insulating unless you have several layers of it that have uh, two or three barriers of other air that's imprisoned that helps keep you from being too frigid cold. And I see on the right, there's also just what looks like one pane of glass, although I can't clearly see there may be two with uh, lines behind them. So to me, that suggests that this is not a very frigid climate, although I know in fact that it is. So something is going on that I don't see here. There has to be some kind of insulation that's keeping everybody from freezing to death. You just proved yourself wrong once again in a good way to sort of because you keep saying, I'm not an architect, but you just proved you are. You're pretty <laughs> right on. Matt, what could we add to that expertise? Uh, uh, well, I, I assume we're looking at at least a double, if not triple glaze, um, uh, wall system with uh, uh, sun shading devices or lamella between the glass panels that um, keep the sun from reaching the interior and, and overheating it, uh, which would be a fairly typical installation for uh, for Germany in particular. I don't know whether I'm on the mark there. You've, you're the only one of the three of us who's actually touched this building, so you have to. Yeah. I know. Further report because I will be in it tomorrow with the students from inside out, which is more important. And we also have the floor plan here that we fished from the from the web. Uh, Foster, after this, this precedes his most iconic and uh, sort of a hero for high rise, the Kommerzbank in Germany, in Frankfurt, in Germany. So not that far away from this, where he inverted and basically took the circulation you know, outside of the building and, and freed its core, which is something that your building in Harvard is doing a lot. Um, and he was doing this with the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank already in um, earlier in the late 70s. And here he's sort of probably because of the typology being rather sort of developer driven or a small actually engineering firm that sort of drove this that maybe you know from the plan, it's maybe not as innovative as it's from its envelope, which yes, very much. Um, it is a, um, which we call a doppel facade. Uh, there are two facades, two glass envelopes on top of each other. There's 18 centimeters cavity space in between. And that basically the, the, the one in the back uh, is, is double, probably double pane at that time because triple pane wasn't around. And then there's a single plane uh, layer at the, very, at the very front. And we also see uh, indications of transportations in front of it, right? We see on the right, we see light rail, which we should have back in Honolulu as we keep talking about because you had electric streetcars, this Soto, just like that on grade and we need these back. And we also, uh, the, the, the picture at the top left is uh, borrows from our to be, uh, you know, recontinued um, uh, comparing um, autos and arch architecture, the mobile and the immobilia. This is uh, Lenny's newest car, which she bought for around a thousand euros. This is a polo. Have you, DeSoto, ever heard or seen a polo? Because you're a VW expert because you had a bug and a rabbit, but have you ever had a polo? No, I mean, but I've never heard of a polo. I, I, I've heard of the polo, but at the moment I cannot remember much about it. But before we talk about the polo, just below the picture, you showed the, the floor plan of this building. And I want to do that. I want to talk about that quickly. It's very unusual because it looks like a lens shaped building that comes to two sharp points on either side. And I'm wondering what the rationale was or why it was built in this unusual form. Is the, is the lot or the location very skinny that required this or just was it because it looked unusual and interesting? I think we leave this up to the audience to do more detective work because we can only guess so. I'm, I've been on Foster's website and you guys should do this too. But I think that's good homework that we assign to the audience here. And I want to go back to mobility and I want to go back to that cars here. Um, they're actually more than ever in Honolulu, also important to keep to give you a climate zone because you turn the heater on because it is cold. 
right? So way more than anything. This is the Polo 3. Right now, the newest version is the Polo 6. And they've been around since 75 and comparing architecture and automobiles. That was also the year when uh, Foster did one of his first buildings, which was the Willys Faba and Dumas building in Ipswich. And you recall that one from history lessons, uh, Matt? And I do. I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you have a picture? So it's. I, I, I don't, we have to leave this uh, up, okay. we'll bring it next time, we should probably do, okay, next time we promise, we show a 75 Polo, and, and we show the 75, <laughs> which they just call Willie's building, and I mean, the, the, the Willie is just as a sort of a, a, an appetizer for that one, was also a curvy linear in plan building that had an all glass envelope, um, in that case it was, um, I think, uh, single layered, and then he basically moved to double layered. And you see these pretty heavily coated people there, which means, and you also don't see much sun there, right? So in this situation, I will ask the management tomorrow, why don't you move the blinds up so you can soak up whenever there's some sun out there, you can soak it up and then you create passive solar gain, right? And that's, that's the point. This situation um, you will never have in Honolulu, as we know, we don't have to worry about that. However, we have glass buildings, right? We started talking about um, if you could do, if you should do basically these double facades um, in, in Honolulu again. Again, for me, it seems a little bit like too much. Like as if you wear hair, uh, wear a puffy coat and then have a hat that has a wind turbine and a fin film PV that runs the fan and drags it out of your puffy coat. It seems to be too much, but but again, it's, it's at least better than the current buildings because we have predominant uh, uh, you know, double pane glazed high rises that have nothing over it, right? Uh, no external shading, no nothing. So, and one reason you met explained to us how you sell this to clients is that the maintenance of these shading systems, they're very vulnerable to wind and then keep breaking, you know, is you extend the lifetime of that one. So there is a return of investment for investing in an in additional layer of facade, right? Mm -hmm. um, let's go to the next slide. And uh, because this is when we were there uh, in about half a year ago with a whole crew here and see us at the top, at the bottom right in front of the building with including our exotic uh, escapism experts, Zana and the whole bunch here of us. And this is a situation you could imagine, okay, this is Honolulu all the time, right? And in this situation, you would basically bring the shades down and bring the, bring the blinds down, right? So then the sun cannot transfer through the inner uh, thermal threshold and it will keep the building cool. You just somehow have to manage get the heat out of the cavity space. And your firm, uh, Matt, has done this uh, quite a bit, quite a lot in many of the projects. It's almost like a, a signature of the office, these double facades, uh, not just with a genzyme that we looked at last time, but tracing back to the North LB in my hometown um, and, uh, and uh, the Unilever building, and you can obviously mm -hmm. name and mention mm -hmm. a couple more. So again, we just want to keep this discussion going about glass uh, envelopes on the island. Again, uh, you know, this is at least keeping the building cool on the inside. If you go to Foster's website, they're rightly so promoted as a very, very pioneering, bioclimatically ambitious building. And so, yeah, it's just good to revisit um, something from these days that were not really that interested at that time, but. But some were as them, and if I'm not mistaken, I looked it up again, Matt, the office um, of Stefan and you guys started out around that time. It was in 91, right? Is that correct? Yeah, exactly right. Exactly. So, so there you go. Okay, let's return to Honolulu, next slide, and pick up on the, because after all, and perfectly, Matt, that you sit in the engineering building as we're talking, we recognize the green curtains. So let's <laughs> remember, DeSoto, what is the sibling, the equivalent of that on the UH Manoa campus? We have an engineering department there too, right? 
Yeah, yeah, but you know, I do not remember which one that is. And shame on me, That's, but I don't remember. I'm not a person who is at UH too frequently. You you might be in good company. So all the other guys who have this sort of senior moment as well, you need to go back and just watch the shows the two of us did about it. That's exactly and right. And so the arc. The architect um, is a very um, iconic traditional firm in the United States of America. That's Skidmore Owings Merrill. Uh, that they basically designed it. And Skidmore Owings Merrill, we know for a lot of work. And there's one other project on the island that is also by SOM that is preceding the UH uh, Manoa building. So you might say there were some smart people who said, hey, this is actually a pretty cool firm that we might want to take advantage of their expertise as well. And which is that other building this, uh, that we just looked at? Now, see, you're, you're, you're putting me on the spot again. I just, turned, I do. I, I I just do. got older a uh, day before yesterday, is, and, and now I've forgotten you. That is okay. Yeah, happy birthday again. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so that's the Mauna Kea Beach Hotel. Which, uh, see which we see. Right. There we are, which right we there. With our, with, our, with our friend Ron. And the top right is a preview of a show we have to do about it when we sent me there. And that was the first time I saw it. That one is working titled Liquid Stoned Hawaii or something like that. So uh, we just want to, again, point out, you know, smart, um, you know, universities, they have their know eyes out there and see look for innovative practices and that's something that we keep saying uh, we need to um, do again as far as you age maybe back to um, foster uh, one one more time and one last time um, the commer the Commerzbank tower in in frankfurt um, for me always is sort of a um, a variation of uh, what for some including me, is one of the most innovative um, SOM buildings. That that's within the show court at the bottom left, sort of in the middle, that sort of column of three images there. That is the National Commercial Bank in Jeddah in Saudi Arabia, which um, is uh, also basically um, you know, infusing these, uh, these atrium spaces. Uh, in the building and then, you know, spirals them around the more you go up in the building. And that's something that Foster's Commerce Bank also does here, of course, because of the desert, the hot desert, the opaque, the exterior facades are entirely opaque in the, in the uh, Commerzbank Tower in Frankfurt, right? We saw they're more open because we have this tricky sort of ambivalent kind of schizophrenic climate. So that being said, again, just as a little bit of a reminder to our administration, to my employer, you know, watch out for these practices who've proven themselves to do well. So that gets us back to the next slide and your building that you're sitting in. And as we promised in the last show, although we will return, which is also circled in here to these very, very cool um, breakout spaces, but we said, after all, it's also a, a building where some serious research has been done and conducting in laboratories. And that's what we like, would like to talk about now. Um, and we will see them in the next slide, but maybe you want to add something organizationally or so on this slide, Matt. Uh, no, I mean, I think just to kind of situate uh, what we're looking, going to look at, the, 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 the main part of the building uh, is divided into three blocks. The entire building is about 500 feet long. And so it was important to break the scale of the building down by, ex by expressing it as three separate building blocks uh, with the research laboratories inside. So you can kind of see along the top part of this picture where those three divisions happen. And then in between those uh, laboratory blocks are where the collaborating spaces are for scientists and researchers and engineers to come out of the labs. Uh, and be in a more tempered environment, let's say. Is that, uh, Matt, when I'm looking at this, is that the area on the left that's labeled area, uh, area lounge? Yes, exactly. That's one there. And then on the other side uh, of that central gray block with the, with the labs in it, there's the other one between the other two boxes. Right. And Matt, I'm and just looking at, slide. Uh, uh, let oh. me just quickly ask, Matt, I'm looking at the room that you're in with the green curtain and the distinctive ceiling. But I'm seeing yeah. is that is that acoustical tile on the left 
or what is that? Because it looks like the kind of acoustical tile we used to have in buildings back in my youth, which is many years ago. On the wall here? Yeah, yeah, with the little holes. Yeah, yeah, it's it's actually a perforated drywall, so it's it's okay. Normal, it's the same thing. Normal. Yeah, and it has a acoustical backing behind it to keep the sound. It's basically for sound purposes. Right. Okay. That's and so this is a this is a quiet room. Uh, it sort is of. A, this is a like a like a eight person uh, meeting room basically. Okay. A conference room. And that's in one of the, the. Okay, and that's in the area lounge section. Uh, it's not too far. It just, so just below that, you see a kind of a white triangular area with yes. the atrium. That's the atrium that's behind me. Here. Okay. So okay. I'm one. I'm. This, we're looking at the fourth floor plan, and I'm on the fifth floor yeah. here. But okay. That's the space. If we're going there. to the next slide, is is that the room at the bottom left that you're sitting in, or one alive? No, that's that room is way down on level two. Um, Okay. But it's all part of the same space, which is this atrium space or these atrium yeah. spaces run up through the, the height of the building. Yeah, yeah. And we also see the labs, so where the people do their right. hands-on research there. Right? And so I yeah. can see that the, the lab spaces are big and they're full of a lot of perhaps solid surfaces. So maybe they're noisy and maybe the room that you're in is to get away well, from that noise. Uh, yeah, partly. Although the the acoustic control throughout the building is a big uh, was a big concern of ours. So, of course, in a space like I am, this is intended to be very quiet. Uh, but the laboratories, even though the general level of noise in them is is higher because of all the machines that they have running in there and so forth, uh, the steel decking that we use to create the uh, the floor slab, which is the ceiling of those laboratories, is perforated as well and has acoustical insulation in it. Uh, so that uh, acoustical control in the laboratories is as good as, as you can make it, you know, in a space that's like that. Um, and then just over my right, sh right hand shoulder in that atrium space, you can see uh, sort of above me, these lamella, this lamella ceiling, which is also perforated with acoustical insulation inside of each of the lamellas to control the sound in the, big, in the open public space. That's fascinating. Thank you for telling me. No, I mean, <laughs> honestly, because I would never have known that. And it's a big and it's a big topic in a, in a big public building like this. How do you create open spaces that all spill into one another, um, but still give people the feeling that, uh, you know, they have a certain amount of control over their environment um, and they're not buffeted by noise or by cold air currents and so on and so forth. Yeah. And to illustrate that spilling in open space, uh, please, the next slide that um, you see this very, very clearly here in, in that section, how that sort of volcano erupts <laughs> through the building as to use a Hawaiian theme familiar to us. The and volcano. How, again, like. it, yeah. <laughs> and, and again, how, yeah, I mean, the, the labs have to be more sterile. There has to be, there's all these requirements, right? So you can't really do much. But that's why you contrast it so lively with uh, with these with these semi public spaces here in the building that whenever people you know get out of there out of there then they get you know uh, all the other senses activated and one of the most important ones is the social sense right and people right. and not just you know working next to each other there but focusing on the work but then you know people talking to each other and exchanging that's what a a vibrant university, you know, should should foster in their in their own self interest, right? Yeah, and, and even in the laboratories, we try. You know, I mean, you're right; they are technical spaces. They have a lot of technical requirements. Uh, they are also intended to be highly flexible, and uh, the nature of what's built in them changes quite often. But at the same time, people have the same kind of human needs when they're working in those kind of spaces for long periods of time that people have everywhere, which is the ability to see outside and connect with nature, yeah. Uh, yeah. a lit environment, um, and the ability to see their fellow, fellow sort of occupants. So that's, those are important yeah. features of those spaces, even though they yeah. themselves are fairly technical in nature. And Absolutely. so in looking at this side view, there are two levels below grade, but on the left, is that an open area to the, to the, it is. the sky? Okay. It is. It's an open court. We, we cut that into the old foundation of the building uh, precisely because we were going to put occupied spaces below grade and needed to be able to 
um, give people again that connection to the outside and to daylight and to air, uh, as well as an opportunity to come out of the below grade spaces and just go outside for a few minutes if they wanted to do so. So um, that's exactly what that is. Yeah. And also in the section, coming back to the sort of beginning of the show here today, on the right side, we see that sort of indicated um, something going on as a double facade, but in this case, a little different. And we see that sort of section perspective cut on, on the left, that stuff that's kind of fading out. And since we're at the end of the show, we still bring the next slide up just as in to mouthwater you for discussing this further uh, next week and to find out. And so what's in the distance there, this is what we will um, pay attention to in the next show a lot. And for the time being, we stay inside and enjoy one of these breakout spaces here. They're just really, really pleasant, as you say, at connecting with nature, looking outside, having a tall, very tall ceiling there, um, and still with all the little tricks that you don't shove in people's face, but you cleverly and elegantly integrate into everything. It's just a really feel-good, well-being place and space there. That um, Yeah, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, the photograph was taken uh right is in the middle of covid so the the building was not able you know we weren't able to have people in the photographs which is always preferable um yeah. but also those spaces i mean the nature of the, the furnishings there is such that they can all be kind of pushed away to one side and that space used for other kinds of events speaking events there's projection and av in these spaces they could have uh you know cocktail parties dinners informal social events and things like that uh so really it's yeah. about trying to create social create social spaces at many different scales throughout the building to accommodate all the diversity of uses that happen here and this just shows another difference to other practices because the other architects probably including like Vignoli you worked for before they always want to get their money shots party shots without anything in there without people and you know the banish practice being the opposite it's all about the people so you want people in there so um yeah, we're at the end of the show. Uh, so we look forward to see you next week to discuss more what kind of mysterious stuff we saw in the background there on the outside. And yeah, you have to get back to us to find out what that is. And until then, please stay a people and planet friendly, planet and people friendly as you guys. Bye bye. Hi. Hi. Thanks, Martin. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.